Welcome back guys. The snow that you saw just in the opening there, that was from about three days ago. Thankfully it warmed up, the snow melted. Uh, there's still a bit of frost in the ground, but it's not too bad. I can actually work the ground. Importantly, we have a big shipment of trees that's coming today and we're taking the day off work to plant trees. So stick around and this is gonna be useful for you if you're transforming a grass area into a food forest and you haven't had time to sheet mulch. So as you may know from my sheet mulch guides, ideally I like to prep an area at least a year in advance for when the trees go in. I did the old man walking trail last fall. Leaves specifically will take a little longer to break down, especially if you don't micromanage them. There's some non-shredded leaves down there. They're gonna take longer to break down. So I don't really wanna plant too much of that out this year. I'm really targeting next year for that area down there. However, I still have a bunch of trees coming and I gotta put them somewhere. I'm putting these trees right in grass and I'm gonna sheet mulch afterwards. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go around, dig some holes, figure out where these trees are going. We're gonna get them in the ground. Everything else can be dealt with later. Okay, with all that being said, because I didn't prepare enough area for 27 giant nut trees plus a bunch of support bushes and vines um, we're gonna go dig some holes in grass and we're gonna do it kind of like if you just moved into cookie cutter suburbia and you got nothing but a grass lawn and you decided i think i'll maybe start a food forest and you already have trees in your driveway waiting to get planted so that's today's video this is you know as poorly as i can set up a tree planting day it's like this Okay, so if you're the type of person who's really afraid of planting your trees, I, I, the one thing I want this video to teach you is to stop. Stop worrying that you're gonna kill your trees. I've mentioned before that before I got to this property and started permaculture, um, as much as I enjoyed the outdoors, I wasn't a gardener at all. So before I started this permaculture journey, I lived in suburbia um, in a, a town of about, uh, about 150,000 people, fairly large footprint for the town, and I lived on the outskirts of that, but I lived in a typical cookie cutter neighborhood. Every house that I had before that was in suburbia. I grew up in suburbia. I grew up with a house with a perfect lawn and really not much else on there, maybe the odd tree or bush. And um, one of the things I did do in my old property is I planted some maple trees. I planted two maple trees in the back and a crab apple. Um, kind of along the fence when I planted those trees. I had no idea what I was doing I dug a hole. I stuck the tree in the ground. I put the dirt back on top I didn't mulch. I didn't pay attention to how deep I planted the tree I didn't water it after I planted the tree I did nothing and those trees are massive today You can't screw this up Everything that I teach on this channel and everything that I'll teach you in today's video It's how to take it to the next level how to actually match the fungal uh, dominated soil, the soil ecosystem to what the tree wants. How to set your trees up for the optimal long-term success by planting them at a proper depth in the hole. That's not something that's gonna impact the tree for a really long time, if it ever does, and the tree will probably figure its way out. Okay, so if you're afraid of planting a trees, if you think you need like a 10-step guide and you're gonna follow it, step by step the whole way down you're worried about what soil amendments to put in there you're worried about how to plant them how big to do the circle how deep to do it how high to do the tree ball um, how to mulch what type of mulch you know just forget about all that stuff I'll teach you a little bit today but worst case just get planting okay so we're in the front yard now we're starting to extend this food forest strip out I really want to get it wider where it feels like a forest and not like a strip of fruit trees, like an orchard laneway alley. So um, we're going to extend this out. We're going to put the dominant overstory spe species as nuts. And we're going to kind of connect this in to here and have a big almost like field of food forest in there with plants that I don't need to get in very often um, so that it can be really wide. I don't have to worry about humans going in and out of it that much. So we'll do stuff like these giant nut trees. Um, in that area and um, as we get closer we'll kind of connect it into this drip edge guild we'll widen the drip edge guild out a bit we've got some buffalo berry nitrogen fixers to add in we've got uh, pear 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 and then we've got some pawpaws and elderberries um, currants uh, sage just kind of this typical host of characters in there 
we'll kind of thicken and widen it up and we'll put in we'll maybe even do like a field from this whole area here connecting to that maple and we'll widen that right out and we'll put some nut trees on the south side of these maples this is a very high sun spot and it's fairly well draining because this land all flows this way down we'll try to arrange the guilds on contour as much as possible to stop and hold that water um, but at the end of the day i can't cut right across my front lawn without you know the wrath of my family um, so we'll do our best to try to stop slow hold spread and sink that water and then we'll yeah we'll add some nut trees on the south side of these uh, maples just to kind of get it a little thicker more foresty in here okay sun is setting and i'm going to quickly do a update video on how i planted this stuff um, family's inside eating dinner so i gotta be pretty quick Okay, so again, ideally you're prepping this spot um, a year in advance and you're not going to do it like this, but this still works. So you're going to cut just the grass off of the top and as you cut, you're basically going to try to knock the soil back in as much as you can. Keep as much as that soil as you can. Once you plant it in that area, this is a an extra hole that I dug because I thought I was getting my pecans, but they're from another nursery, so... I'll save this area for when the pecans come. Um, as you go, you're going to take the grass that you had and you're going to flip it upside down and you're just going to put it back. So this would be going kind of as a mulch all around the tree. And then you want to kind of break it up into a few smaller parts just so that the water can get, get uh, down to where the roots of the tree are. Um, this will all decompose. You don't want it super thick because the roots of the tree really should be roughly at um, ground level. So try to knock as much of that dirt off and get that grass layer as thin as possible. But remember, over time, we're going to wood chip over top of this and over time that'll break down completely. So after you plant the tree, you flip the grass, put it on. You're going to soak and water the tree to the point where it pools. You're going to let that sink in and then you're going to soak it again until it pools. And the water pulling down into the soil will draw all the soil back around the roots and it'll um, fill up any air spots that the digging kind of left behind because roots do want air but they don't want to be surrounded in air they really do want to have soil touching them and then after that you can cover it with wood chips you can do cardboard on top of this cover it with wood chips if you want but even just this this is at least a good start. The trees are in the ground and I'll go show you a couple of them. Okay, so this is the trellis and all along this trellis we've got um, climbing kiwi and we've got black Carpathian walnuts. So these are juggling species. We're going to try the kiwi out to see if they grow well with them. The um, juggling species, the Carpathian walnuts, they're small right now. So the juglone um, interference, it's like an uh, allelopathy. A chemical attack it won't really work that strongly while the tree is young like this so the kiwi shouldn't get a chance to get up and we're going to grow kiwi up the south side of this arbor we have grapes growing up the north side and the idea with the carpathian walnuts is that in time you know 10 or 20 years from now they will actually replace this arbor and we're going to have a living arbor and we'll prune the branches to kind of go over and meet in with the grapes Okay, so here's an example of an, uh, a tree that's done now. Um, this, I believe, is a bark nut. Yeah, so this is a bark nut. And um, we will absolutely mulch this with wood chips. We'll sheet mulch this area to get the grass competition down. For now, it's in the ground and it's happy. And what happens from now towards the future, that's where we really take advantage. For now, we just have the trees getting in the ground and that's good enough. Okay, we've added some hazelnuts to the hazelnut block. And uh, these are also hazel burts in here and uh, filberts as well. Remember with hazelnuts, they are wind pollinated, typically things that have catkins. They're the long droopy, let me see if I can see any catkins. So there's still a few up on this hazelnut. 
So anything with these catkins, they tend to be wind pollinated. So you want to plant them in clusters and in blocks, kind of like corn. Corn is similar. All right, we also added some kiwi on the side here. And what we're going to do is we're going to grow kiwi up some, we'll probably put a trellis or something more formal there for now. We just have some logs that they can um, climb up and they'll climb right across. I want kiwi kind of draping around. I don't even have Shaw Direct anymore. Um, so we'll get rid of that this year. I think that's been up for four or five years now. I didn't even notice it. And I'm showing you the ugliest part of my property. This is so ugly and my wife hates it. So what we're doing now is we're going to sheet mulch this area. Um, it's kind of a low value area because our septic is in and around here. We've got electrical for the hot tub, which we never use. Um, it's in and around here. I think we used the hot tub once and I felt so gross in the hot tub with all those chemicals and pouring chemicals in water that I was then like bathing in. As soon as I found out about permaculture and started getting conscious of the chemicals that I was exposing my body to, we just completely stopped using the, the hot tub. So we'll probably get rid of that, maybe even turn it into a garden bed or something. Um, but we've got some Rigosa roses in here now and they'll kind of grow six to eight feet tall, six feet wide, and they'll use this weird, awkward hill and they'll be just fine and dandy there. Um, so, you know, they're really strong plants, so they're not too fussy. We'll sheet mulch this area, get the grass competition down. We'll get a nice back row of roses coming back in behind here. And then we'll do probably raised beds in front of it. We'll kind of level out the area, do some raised beds, I think, here. Another reason why I haven't planted this out is through the trellis, you can see rail ties. Rail ties are loaded with tar. They're absolutely disgusting. I wanted to pull them out, but the guy who came to pull them out said, you know what, you're better just leaving them and not planting anything around here. So we'll do some Rigosa roses up here, off the fence a little bit. And that way we're not going to be like ingesting any of the tar. They kind of end right about here and then the Rugosa roses start there. And we'll definitely preferentially pick and eat the uh, rose hips and the, and the leaves for tea off of the ones the furthest away. And they should be just fine. This area we had an apricot that died cut to the ground and now we've got a peach that replaced it. I figure the peach... Um, my concern with this place, I kind of mentioned a few times, is the weeping tiles for the septic are kind of over here. I think the peach is far enough away, but if it ever is a problem, peaches don't tend to live really long. So I wouldn't want to plant like a hickory or a pecan or a black walnut in this area. Um, but I think a peach will be fine. So we've got a peach here and the peach will kind of be the trellis eventually. For the grapes on this side replacing this arbor hopefully and we can see the peach from the uh, kitchen as well so we've got a nice peach there okay now i just wanted to talk about the size of trees because sometimes we can go buying trees and we've got a nice roughly six foot tall peach I'm here a little bit taller than six feet. I'm just an inch shy of six. So this thing's probably two inches taller than me. And um, this is almost too big for a tree. I can prune this down. I'll probably let it grow a little bit this year, see how it does because it's already budding out. So I don't want to do too much hard pruning on it. And we just, you know, shocked it by digging it up and transplanting it to my property. So we'll wait on the pruning for next year. We'll probably cut it off somewhere here, maybe even down here, and really get that vase shape growing. Um, but just on the general size of the tree, this is almost a little bit too big. Some people might think that this tree here was a better deal than, say, this tree here. Um, and especially if the larger tree was in a pot, at a nursery, you can really do yourself a disservice buying, preferentially buying a tree like this, especially if it was in a pot, than a bare root, um, smaller tree like this one here. Let me show you some examples.
This is a perfect spot to show some examples and I'll show you some more of the trees uh, maybe later the sun's setting uh, but you'll see them in my videos. Uh, maybe I can do this quick and still get some light. I want to show you, this is super important though, um, this apple tree was purchased a year after this peach tree. This peach tree was bare root and it was the size of one of these raspberry canes when we first got it. This apple tree was roughly the size that it is now when we first got that and it was from a pot. Now, I didn't wash out any of the roots, trim them, spread them out. I literally took that root bound pot and planted it. And you can see the difference in a bare root, um, a bare root peach tree that's now probably 20 feet tall and a apple tree that this apple tree may actually be older than this peach because, you know, it was older when we purchased it. It was, it came here a year younger, but you know, it might be the same age, but if anything, this one's probably older and look at the difference. So when I say to get a very small bare root tree, um, it's cheaper and in time, the bare root tree will surpass a potted root bound tree from a box store. Okay, so here's another example. Hasn't been mulched yet. Like I said, we just flipped the grass and got it in the ground. But um, this is a roughly foot and a half tall um, heart nut. And it's basically the root stock and then the graft, which the graft is here. So it was grafted on and then this is all new, new wood from the, uh, it's a Campbell variety, CL3 heart nut. And I'm gonna go show you another family in the same tree, uh, family, a Bart nut, that was smaller than this when we first purchased it, and that was two years ago, maybe, maybe three years ago. And I'll show you what it looks like now. Okay, this guy right here. This is a three-year-old Bart nut tree from the same nursery, and it was, like literally 10 to 12, 12, 10 to 14 inches a couple years ago. And look at it just absolutely exploded. It can send its roots all through the area. It doesn't have a lot of root mass for tree size. It's really important that the height of the tree and the size of the roots roughly match. When you buy a potted tree, typically there's so much root circling around in that pot compared to the size of the tree that uh, even though the roots are small compared to the size of the tree, because the pot's pretty small, the amount of roots in that pot kind of are at balance with the size of the tree. And that tree just kind of ends up stunted. And the roots are kind of circling around. They got to kind of find a lateral to push out, but the, root, the tree's kind of already got its allotment of roots for the size of the tree. So it just kind of sits there and and does nothing until it basically dies. So this is why you want bare root trees because look at the growth on this three-year-old bare root bark nut. Now these are fast growing trees, but still, this is incredible. Okay, so we're at the top of the waterfalls here and I do wanna show you a couple other plants so that when you're watching my videos, you can kind of keep an eye out for them if you're one of those watchers that really loves my channel and gets into every video. Um, this here is a brand new um, female sea buckthorn. I got Chicksaya, oh, and I got Sunny. So here's a Sunny. So Sunny variety. And we've also put one, oops, sorry for spinning the camera right here. Oh, I got another variety too. This is the one, what is this one called again? Titan. So this is Titan, and this one is supposed to have the largest uh, berries of all. So this will be really fun. And we've put another one here, right next to that bark nut. And this one here is a Sunny. So these are all females. We've got a male, which is a Lord variety, and it will pollinate all of these. And it's a little further behind me. We've also got the wild ones, um, which some are male, some are female, and they're planted throughout the property. So we've got decent pollination. But you do need a male and female varieties for sea buckthorn. Okay, just down that path, so here's the pond here. Just further down the path, 
I dug up a peach right here and right next to it nitrogen fixing sea buckthorn. Um, this one here I believe is a titan. I don't know where the tag went. But I do believe that's a titan as well. They were a little smaller. Um, they'll get bigger but they're, they were just a little smaller when I got them. So I do believe that's a titan. So we've got, uh, I wanted to kind of plant this edge out because it was really just wood chips. So now we've got daffodils. Um, we've got some uh, lavender and uh, some lamb's ear, some garlic, and now we have sea buckthorn and a peach. And we're kind of just fleshing out and building out some of these little corner sections. Transplanted a has cap here. I was really rough with this one, um, taking this cutting. So this was after the video that I did on the has caps. Uh, we, I don't know if that one will live. But I did put one there. Um, we've got a sea buckthorn just on the downside of this. This is on the sunny side. This big cedar really does shade this out. So sea buckthorn really do want um, really, really high sun. This is pushing it for sure. And so is this. Uh, but hopefully they do get enough sun. So there's a chicksaya there. And we've got sea buckthorn three of them around that peach over there, uh, Hergo and Chuxaya varieties, and they did fantastic last year on that little island, full blasting sun on them. They were very happy there, so I'm excited to see how those ones do this year. And then down this pathway here, I thought it would be really fun to walk underneath a tropical looking papaya tree. So we've, of course, put a pawpaw this is KSU Chappelle. Will it focus? KSU Chappelle. So we've got a tiny little pawpaw. They're slow growers, so you probably won't see much from that guy for probably about three, four years. So if you're still hanging around the channel three, four years from now, there should be a slightly larger tropical pawpaw there, which I think is a really fun little path. So, uh, when the um, when the pond builder finished this, they kind of left a couple little tiers, and then I went and added a bunch of stepping stone pathways walking around them and planted out all around them. So I think this little pathway is going to be a fun little spot to walk down around a pawpaw and then um, forage off of a service berry. And then we've got some sea buckthorn here we've got a plum there and then we'll finish out continuing to work on this downhill side and we'll flesh this out as the years go by and we'll connect this down into old man walking trail that'll be really fun i'm thinking i'm going to do a string of pawpaws so that i have a string of cross pollination going down to the lower pawpaw area at the bottom of the hill way down in there so way down in there, that's where we have the Pawpaw Guild, the original one. Okay, so we're completely losing our sun. I wanted to say one more thing, because this is all about planting your new trees. You know, you had grass and now you're starting a food forest. You don't even have wood chips, you don't have cardboard, you just have nothing. You have grass and some trees that came. So I just want to talk about a little bit. Don't get disheartened when you start a new area and you're like, yay, I have a food forest. And you're like, this is a tree, believe it or not. You know, it's like 12 inches tall. You've got a tiny uh, Rosa Rugosa bush there. You've got a peach here, Hascap there, service berry there, and another peach. We've got some buffalo berry that I put in there that I can't see because they're so small. I think three buffalo berries are in here. They're a nitrogen fixer. And then we've got a linden tree actually. So this was a nice one. Um, this is a edible leaf on this tree and uh, it's a great pollinator. It's got a weird shape. It's straight up, everything's straight up. So we'll maybe try to, we might try to prune around that one a little bit, but lindens kind of don't want to be touched. So we might also just leave it. It's not like we're going to trim for fruit production. It's it's really an insect support tree. It'll get really tall, but it's on the north edge of all my gardens. It's got a little sea buckthorn next to it. So um, what I kind of wanted to say is 
you're gonna plant your stuff out and you've got like a tree a tree with a sea buckthorn there you're like yeah i made a guild and then you've got another sea buckthorn all by itself way over there that's the male pollinator to kind of connect all the sea buckthorn around and then oh, we've got bunnies and birds kind of neat so you're gonna have all these like little trees around and uh don't eat my new plants oh if you bite that i'm gonna go running he's checking it out i have to let him check it out but don't bite it quit it it's a sea buckthorn so it'll be able to bounce back but don't get disheartened because the trees are so tiny but you saw when i was talking about the peach and that peach was like a foot tall when I first got it. Um, actually, it was more like two feet tall. And now it's like 20 feet. And it's, I look at that tree all the time and I'm just in awe of how gorgeous it is. Where's the robin? Let you look at something besides just me talking. And just don't get disheartened that you did all this work and you planted this guild out. And this is what it looks like right what matters is what you do from now forward so we'll sheet mulch this and then we got a lifetime to fill in and cram in you know look at all the plants that we've crammed in all here and nothing's even leafed out yet you can barely see anything like this is a this is a service berry right here so this is going to be a 12 foot tall tree one day you know, planted right next to a sea buckthorn and an elderberry and an apple and a currant. You know, with support plants all around it. Some mint and a whole bunch of stuff. So just don't get discouraged because you will get to that. Even though this doesn't look nice and impressive yet, it will this uh, summer when it all leaves out. But you're going to start here. So if you're watching my videos and, you know, you get your big tree order and you get all these little one foot tiny trees that you might mow if you're not paying attention to and you wouldn't even know it because they're so small, just don't get discouraged. It really does. If you do the right thing, it really does pick up and build very quickly. One last thing I want to show you before I let you go. main food forest strip so we are in a transition year i believe that this is a critical year I, this should almost be a video on its own and i think i will do it also but i'll use it as a cap to this one there's a certain period of a food forest where you need to take action if you want a vining layer i believe for my food forest strip that time is right now the two things that you're balancing is if you plant vines um, so I'm saying this because I planted some kiwi at the base of some of these trees, which I'll go show you. If you plant the kiwi near the young trees too soon, the kiwi grows really fast. It will climb up the tree and pull it down and break it and damage it. And that tree will never get large enough to be the trellis for the kiwi. The kiwi will, or the grape will just grow way too quick for it. The problem though, is that if you wait too long... Um, I had started kiwi under that giant maple there, and it did not work at all. I started kiwi even under this flowering dogwood um, over here, and it didn't work at all. I've pulled it forward out away from the trunk to get a little more sunlight. Still not working very well. The problem is if you wait too long, the trees are so big that they shade out the vines, and then the vines never really grow. So there's this transition period from... If you start too early, the vines will pull the trees down. They'll grow really well because they got lots of sun and the trees will get pulled down by the vines. You wait too long and the vines will never grow because the trees are way too dominant and um, will smother the light out from the vines. Right around this age, kind of the 6 to 12 year mark is I think when you want to start the vines. So, for example, we've got a pear tree that... And pears want to reach nice and high and they are very strong trees. So I've put a female kiwi here and we've got a male kiwi back in there. Hopefully that pear 